Observing our environment is a harder task than it might first appear. Being able to detect, measure and monitor sources, sinks and stores of carbon across the entire globe is a mammoth task. But it's been made considerably more achievable by using satellites to study our land, our oceans and our atmosphere. The way in which carbon moves through the environment, known as the carbon cycle, is key to measuring and hopefully reducing climate change. We have three stories about how satellites are being used to help our understanding of the environment and fill in the gaps in our knowledge of the carbon cycle. Paul Palmer from the School of Geosciences at the University of Edinburgh is going to tell us how satellites have helped us find and measure a new source of methane from Central Africa. Matt Disney from the Department of Geography at University College London will talk about how satellites have improved our understanding of the health of tropical forests. And Gemma Cook from the Plymouth Marine Laboratory is going to explain how years of satellite images have helped us monitor phytoplankton in the oceans. Hello, my name is Paul Palm and I'm going to tell you about some work we've done recently to understand atmospheric methane. The global annual growth of atmospheric methane has, since the start of this century, been full of surprises. A stop, a start, followed by a modest acceleration. Our understanding of these changes is incomplete, mostly because we don't have sufficient measurements, but this is beginning to change. The first satellite sensitive enough to measure small changes of methane in the lower atmosphere was launched in 2009. The name of the Japanese instrument is called GOSAT. And we now have over a decade of self-consistent measurements from GOSAT that are beginning to reveal some of the regions responsible for large-scale changes in atmospheric methane. Here is one example. Using a model to interpret GOSAT data over East Africa, we found that emissions of methane had grown substantially from 2010 to 2016, peaking in 2015 and 2016. On closer inspection, we found this increase was centred over the Sud wetland in South Sudan, a place we didn't expect to find large emissions of methane. The emission estimates we found for the Sud and the surrounding area over this period represented a third of the global increase in methane emissions during that period. Now, for a moment, we were confused because these emissions didn't occur during periods of overhead rainfall. Now this is important because from a very simplistic perspective, wetlands need three things to produce methane. Organic matter that can be processed by microbes, warm temperatures to speed up the activity of the microbes, and moist conditions. Now this last point isn't obvious, but for the wetlands to emit methane into the atmosphere, the methane producing microbes or methanogens produce methane in oxygen poor environments have to overcome other microbes that consume methane, methanotropes. And that is more likely to happen when the microbes are producing methane directly from the water into the atmosphere, in other words, during flooded conditions. Now what was happening over this region was that water was being collected upstream and being transported downstream. The main catchment areas for this region of the world are Lake Victoria and Lake Albert two very large continental lakes. Now using other satellite data we could see that rainfall was coincident with changes in the height of these two lakes and with the changing height of the White Nile as the water flowed towards the Sud. So all the data weaves together to provide a consistent picture. Now if you pause for a moment you'll realize that what I've just described is that some of the smallest things on Earth, microbes, have the ability to influence the larger scales of Earth's climate. So where does this study leave us? Well, it leaves us with a great deal more questions to address than we started with. We had thought that this result was unusual, because, but during 2018 and 2019, East Africa received a once in a 30 year rainfall event. Using finer scale satellite observations of methane, we once again found large emissions coming from the Sud, but also from the neighboring Sobat River Basin. Once again, the emissions represented a significant fraction of global emissions. So what's the reason for these large rainfall anomalies? They're partly driven by an oscillating gradient of sea surface temperature over the Indian Ocean called the Indian Ocean Dipole. Warmer than normal sea surface temperatures over the western Indian Ocean leads to an increase in rapidly rising air and precipitation over East Africa. This positive phase of the dipole has occurred quite a bit recently helping to explain the unexpectedly large methane emissions that we've reported. So why is this important? Well, climate models are suggesting that in the future, this positive phase of the Indian Ocean Dipole is going to become more frequent and more extreme, which means 
more years in which East African wetlands will play a major role in the growth of atmospheric methane. And as human driven emissions are being driven downwards, this natural source will become more important. So I want to talk about some of the, the, the interesting and important questions that arise when we start thinking about the impacts of climate change and anthropogenic change on tropical forests particularly. We know that tropical forests are incredibly important as stores of carbon, as reservoirs of biodiversity and uh, their, their utility and importance for all kinds of um, the people who depend on them. But forests, and in particular tropical forests, um, have a very different kind of response to climate change than aspects of the atmosphere and the ocean, in as much as they are very static, they are slow growing, they are long lived, and so there are complete contrasts to the kind of rapidity of change in oceans, uh, the oceans and the atmosphere. So when we come to think about how climate and man-made pressures affect forests, uh, we have to look very carefully, not only at the, the similarities between different parts of the tropical forest, but also differences. So some recent work uh, using satellite data uh, over the Brazilian Amazon has shown that although deforestation losses have increased over the last decade, perhaps unexpectedly, um, the actually a lot of the carbon loss is down to degradation rather than deforestation. So about three times as much was lost through degradation rather than deforestation alone. So what's the difference? Well, degradation is everything else that doesn't lead directly to deforestation. So that can be selective logging, that can be fragmentation. So the exploitation of small pockets of forest that leave open edges, which are much more prone to, to further damage. Fires, which of course are mostly man-made and are exacerbated by drought. Um, and particularly, we know that the, the forecasts for rainfall and drought events are going to be more and more prolonged and extreme over the forthcoming decades. So this is a really interesting um, piece of work because it shows that if we focus only on deforestation and we ignore or perhaps downplay the issues of, of degradation, we will miss most of the carbon loss. So that understanding that kind of process is really important. It's, it's key to how we frame our responses to those, um, those changes and how we think about protecting and um, enhancing those forests. The other aspect that this shows is that, you know, we're seeing how um, satellite data can show us the differences in responses of different pieces of tropical forest. Not all tropical forests are alike. When we look at Southeast Asia, we look at the Congo Basin, and we look at uh, the uh, uh, Amazonian region, we see these areas respond differently to both climate and man-made pressures. And so satellite data is one of the key ways that allows us to, to unpick those differences and then, of course, formulate what we're going to do about that in different ways. We're going to have to have different plans for these, these different parts of the, of the tropics. And it's really satellite data that are enabling us to unpick those differences. My love for the ocean stems from family holidays and long weekends near the seaside. On one of those holidays, I was inspired to become a marine biologist. What I did not realize at the time is that so much life is hidden in the oceans. The surface of the ocean is inhabited by phytoplankton, microscopic organisms that photosynthesize like plants. Collectively, phytoplankton are responsible for cycling a huge amount of carbon through the marine ecosystem. So we cannot study the global carbon cycle without taking into account the role of phytoplankton in it. Knowing that phytoplankton are so small and well hidden, it seems a contradiction that we are able to see them from space. But when we go into space, we can see large patterns appear on the ocean surface, and those are billions and billions of phytoplankton cells. The pigments that phytoplankton use for photosynthesis appear as green, brown or red, and we can observe those colors from space using ocean color satellites. Observations from space help us to study phytoplankton at the global scale. We can study where and when they grow, and we can also use ocean color satellites to estimate how much carbon is taken up by phytoplankton. We now know that this is about 50 gigatons carbon per year, which makes phytoplankton equally important to plants on land.
We have been bringing data from different satellite sensors together to create the longest time series possible so that we can begin to look at climate variability and its impact on phytoplankton. With over two decades of observations, we can study the change in carbon uptake by phytoplankton over time. At the global scale, this trend is not straightforward as it goes up and down over the 21 years of our time series. Variability in this trend is linked to the Earth's climate system. And one of the dominant causes for changes in this system is the El Niño phenomenon. During an El Niño event, the surface of the ocean warms in the central and eastern Pacific Ocean, and the coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere causes global variability in our climate. Because phytoplankton grow fast, they can respond quickly to such changes, and our research has shown that the uptake of carbon by phytoplankton is linked to such events. Studying the influence of phenomena like El Niño helps us to understand the impact of long-term climate changes on phytoplankton and the ocean carbon cycle.